Let's talk high-tech space dwarves, big grudging and ancestral fury with an overview of Leagues of Botan in Warhammer 40k 10th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're talking Leagues of Botan with a full overview and discussion of their index in 40k 10th. 40k's newly reimagined squads have certainly had a bit of a rocky ride since they came out around about a year ago now. Crazy enormous massive power that got nerfed almost at the same time as the codex dropped, though since then they have still done at least okay despite some fairly astronomically high unit costs and almost raw damage dealing power from their codex seeing them through with those auto wound judgement tokens. In 10th edition though, I must admit things don't look quite so rosy for them. Out of the gate in terms of power rankings, they seem to be one of 40k's least strong factions right now. Maybe not quite with the same sort of problems as Admech and Death Guard, though not all that far ahead. They have had a lot of slightly unhelpful changes to their index and data sheets, I must admit, plus their army range is kind of small, but there's certainly still some interesting stuff here, and I feel like their Iron Hair Half Guard are still doing okay. Jumping into it, in Index Leagues of Votan, we have similar sort of army rules to what we get in the others. Their overall faction rule is Eye of the Ancestors, basically their judgment tokens reimagined, now giving you a plus one to wound if you can get two of them. Their launch detachment is the Oath Band. This one gives you a boost against one unit right from the start of the game and a bit of a quest to kill that unit to generate you some CP. It does come with the normal supporting rules as well, 6 stratagems and 4 enhancements for your characters. Then we've got the index data sheets, just the 12 of them, no real major changes on these. Perhaps the biggest disappointment there might not be having any sort of unique unit for their kill team as that could have been nice to give them one further option to play with. Putting that together we've also got their points cost in the Munitor and Field Manual as well and we'll talk through each of the units in turn with that. First up though, let's talk through their army supporting rules. I have the Ancestors is their faction special rule, heavily redesigned from 9th edition, and as mentioned, I do feel like it's a lot less powerful than the auto wounds on a 4 plus to hit, which was kind of hard to balance, I thought. It was absolutely monstrous against certain big units, but tended to be a bit lacklustre if your opponent had lots of things that hit, particularly in context of easy options to get full rerolls to hit on a unit, so you could basically be pretty much auto wounding with most of your attacks. In 10th edition though, things have been toned down a little bit I'd say. Now rather than having a 3 judgement token system, you can now get a maximum of 2. With the first one that you get on a target, you get plus 1 to hit, and then if you get 2 tokens on a target, you get plus 1 to wound as well, so they still do get significantly easier to take down if you stack 2 on them. How they're handed out has changed a bit though. The main mechanic for actually getting judgement tokens going are enemy units killing leagues of Votan units. Every time they kill a leagues of Votan units, they gain a judgement token. Now there's no option for handing them out when they're just standing on objectives or doing actions or anything. Gives you a little bit less control over that. Otherwise, there's just three other primary ways to hand out more tokens. Cars still hand them out in the command phase, and that's perhaps the other easiest way to get a hold of them. There's a one command point stratagem that you can sometimes use if your opponent depletes but doesn't kill a unit, and you can also get two of them from the game start from your detachment rule as well. But in general, there aren't really all that many ways of getting judgment tokens on your foes. The judgment tokens do also come with a few supporting rules just to talk about units that get altered over the course of the game. If the enemy resurrects the same unit rather than getting an identical copy of it, it'll come back with the same number of judgment tokens. That could be relevant for certain resurrection stratagems, maybe Angron for the World Eaters or Necrons resurrecting their characters. And then if a unit splits, then it gets the same judgment tokens as the original unit had. And if they combine for any reason, then they get judgment tokens as for the unit with the single most. Those latter two are maybe a bit more rare though. Perhaps the resurrection one is the most likely to come up. As for the buffs themselves, plus one to hit is usually going to be either a 25% or 33% damage boost. Definitely handy, but not quite as big. A lot of it is perhaps unfortunately going to just feel like getting the leagues of Votan back to where they were before, as quite a lot of units have gone from hitting on a 3 plus to hitting on a 4 plus. For actually getting more damage going, I think that 2 tokens really is where it's at. The plus 1 to hit is nice, but the plus 1 to wound really is a very big deal, particularly against tough stuff as before. Big vehicles and things still aren't going to feel quite as brutal and hard to take down if even if your small arms are wounding them on a 5+, plus, and true anti-tank weapons are finding them very easy to wound indeed. Between the plus 1 to hit and plus 1 to wound, you're usually going to be getting somewhere between plus 50 and plus 100% damage output if you can get two of them off. It is a mechanic that they're definitely going to need to play around, but it does feel like one that's maybe not in your control quite as much as your opponent maybe, and it's not really too possible to spam bunches of really cheap units even the cheapest leagues of Votan stuff still runs you at a fair few points. Overall, I feel like the core mechanic isn't terrible, but it would be a lot better if there were a lot of different ways to augment it and hand out tokens out a bit more, other than just Carl's and a couple of more situational things. 
Next up for the leagues of Botan launch detachment, we've got the Oath Band detachment. The detachment rules may be a slightly curious one, perhaps. Ruthless efficiency for this one basically lets you nominate one key enemy unit at the start of the game. They start on two judgment tokens, so that unit in particular will be easier to take down. And I guess in general, you're likely to put that on the biggest, scariest, most aggressive enemy unit that they have. Maybe an Imperial Knight that's almost bound to be moving forward. Or perhaps a big block of Terminators or something. Might be a little bit less overwhelming if there isn't one of those in the opponent's army. If they maybe have lots of units that can just hide or the opponent doesn't care too much about them being killed individually. If you do manage to bring down your marks targets, then you get a boost depending on when you manage to kill it. You get more command points depending on how early you can kill it in the game. 3 CP if it's basically killed during your first turn, technically by your first or second command phases, though it's basically never going to be dead by your first command phase unless your opponent manages to get it killed somehow. Then just 2 CP which I feel like is a bit more reliable, usually you killing it in either turn 2 or turn 3 of yours, and then 1 CP if it's in your turn 4. These command points at least have the advantage of being in addition to any other ways of farming command points and gaining more throughout the game. Though it looks like the main way of getting those in Leagues of Botan are just with their scanner packs giving you the chance to refarm stratagems, and even that's a touch on reliable. It's definitely not unusable. If your opponent has something that absolutely needs to be moving up the board, then both making it easier to kill and likely getting yourself some command points seems very nice. I guess it does start the judgment tokens rolling it with a little bit of a bang, compared with having to wait for your opponent to kill things beyond that largely. Still though, I don't feel it's quite as powerful as certain other detachment rules out there in 40k, maybe not universally strong against all armies either. Next up, the Oath Band also comes with a slew of different stratagems as well. Warrior Pride is 1 CP, and this one improves AP and melee by 1 point for each judgement token on the target unit, so I guess your weapons get AP-1 better just for 1, or AP-2 better for 2. Seems handy but situational that one, sometimes you might not need it if your unit's just going to wipe out the enemy anyway. Sometimes it might not be too relevant if they've got poor saves or high invulnerable saves, and sometimes it just might not make a difference enough to be worth using the command point on. Hearthkin warriors only have one attack now, so I feel like buffing them is going to be kind of questionable a lot of the time. Could be handy enough though on say a big unit of Chthonian Berserks or the Iron Hair Hearthguard going up against an enemy with some very high saves. Well Lord of Retreat is one command point, this one allows you to fall back, shoot and charge for a unit. This one's a very handy one to have access to, as I'm sure Eldar players will tell you. Means that any one unit isn't guaranteed to be locked in combat if the enemy decides to charge it, they can't just lock up your Thunderkin by engaging them. The same for Land Fortresses and Sagittors, you don't have to make the choice between falling back or not being able to shoot the enemy unit with the rest of your army. That seems pretty cool for the more aggressive units like the Iron Hair Hearthguard as well, if they're locked in an ongoing combat, they can fall back, fire off all their Vulcanite or whatever, and still charge straight back in. Very nice to have access to, going to be well worth the CP in quite a few random situations. Next we've got Ancestral Sentence for 1 CP. This one's a damage buff in the shooting phase. Sustained hits 1 against a normal target without a judgement token on it. Often going to be an average 33% damage increase if say applies to something like a land fortress. Definitely not bad on one of your better shooting units. If you use it on a target that's already got a judgement token on it though, then you get sustained hits 2 instead. That's particularly nice on top of plus 1 to hit. Even compared with the improved damage output, that's an extra 50% damage on your shooting. Often going to be very easily worth 1 CP for the extra wounds you could expect on your targets. Seems good, again is a bit reliant on judgement tokens being present though. Maybe one to hopefully combine with a card to throw this down and then maybe hit them with this in the shooting phase for one squad. Reactive Reprisal is 2 CP and this one's a return fire stratagem. When your unit's shot you get to just shoot back against the unit that shot you. You do have to target that unit though, you don't have the option to fire against something else. And it is a slightly more expensive one at 2 CP, not just one. Again, situationally useful, you need to have an enemy shoot your unit and then there'd be enough of your unit left to actually deal some meaningful damage to that same enemy squad and also have that damage be more valuable than using the command points on other things. Again, as with the previous one, probably going to be best on things like the Thunderkin or a Land Fortress. Could be situationally good on things like Hearthkin Warriors or maybe even Sagittors as well though, particularly if your opponent just fires off some random shots into them with an assault unit closing the distance. I guess the dream would be to cut down an assault unit before it makes a charge. That could be very powerful indeed. Next up, we've got the Void Armor for one command point. This one's not really a feel-good one for the Votan, perhaps, but as it's taking a rule that the army had army-wide and putting it on just one unit for one command point. You can use it in the shooting or the fight phase, though, and it's kind of similar to the Space Marine Armor of Contempt one now. 
when your unit's attached, then it means that for the rest of the phase, you worsen enemy AP by minus one. And that can be pretty powerful, particularly with the two plus safe units in the army, the Land Fortress and the Einheer Hearthguard in particular maybe even more so in 10th edition with quite a lot of weapons losing a bit of AP in the game. It definitely looks like a very usable stratagem still though, reactive durability is nice, and against the right weapon profile this one could be absolutely massive for giving a squad the best chance to survive. Finally we've got Newfound Nemesis, 1 command point for the chance to hand out a judgement token. You can use this one after an enemy unit has either shot or fought, and reduce one of your squads or vehicles down to below half strength but hasn't quite killed it. That enemy unit gains one judgement token early even if they haven't killed a unit and if it happens to be your warlord's unit that got depleted in this way then they just gain a flat two judgement token straight out instead. I feel like it is kind of helpful as it's one of the few ways that you can increase judgement tokens outside of things like Carl's and the actual standard rule for killing units. Against the right enemy it could be kind of good and I suppose you are more likely to have big dangerous enemy units actually taking out halves of squads. Perhaps feels a bit harder to use and a bit more situational compared with the Votan Searchlight stratagem that they had last time round. That was quite a useful one just to trade a command point for a judgement token on a critical unit with the advantage that you could pick the one out that you needed the most if it was in range of your Searchlight model. Overall I'd say that the stratagems are solid enough, maybe not quite as absolutely ludicrously strong as the Leagues of Votan were in 9th edition, they were surprisingly good there, but quite a few of them seem pretty usable in my opinion. Out of these, I like the Order Retreat for insurance against getting locked up in combat, fallback shoot and charge is good, Ancestral Sentence is a very helpful and easy to use direct damage increase, and Void Armor I think will also be a staple just to use on one key unit whenever your opponent hits it with something that's just middling AP, particularly Land Fortresses and Einheer Hearthguard. Finally for the Oathband we've got the Enhancements, there's four of them here. Appraising Glare is 20 points, and each turn your character is allowed to declare an objective marker that your opponent controls, until the end of the phase while an enemy unit in range of that objective marker that counts as having one more judgement token on it more than it actually has. I think as it goes that seems like really quite a good boost, enemy units are pretty much going to be guaranteed to flock to objectives to make sure they hold them against your forces, it's quite nice that you can just choose this to affect a different opponent held objective each turn the one where you're most likely to be damaging your opponent's units. Seems alright for 20 points, I suppose you'd ideally want it on at least a fairly safe character that isn't going to get killed too early. A long list for 15 points is a way of redistributing judgement tokens if your unit kills one with a token. I'd say this one is a bit weaker than its 9th edition version which was very good. Now you can only redistribute the judgement tokens for the unit that's slain if it's actually your unit that did the slaying. I guess this one will pair okay with a really big scary unit like perhaps the Iron Hair Hearthguard or some Brock here Thunderkin with an Iron Master perhaps. Hearthguard with a Carl could be kind of nice. I suppose you could throw a Judgement token on a unit that you're just about to kill, and destroy the unit and reassign it maybe. Next up we've got Grim Demeanor for 20 points. This one allows the units to ignore modifiers to roles or characteristics, so it could be handy to protect against things like stealth, or the unit getting slowed down with a movement debuff, or things like Death Guard Contagions. Kind of an interesting buff to buy in for 20 points, as in quite a lot of games it just might not really matter all that much, but sometimes it could be really big. You also get to reroll Battleshock as well, which I guess isn't nothing. I don't feel like it's terrible value for 20 points, but just a little bit uncertain maybe. I guess if you're absolutely pivotally relying on one unit to do a lot of heavy lifting in your army, then this would help them do so. Might just be a bit less reliably good compared with throwing extra judgement tokens onto objectives perhaps though. Finally for 25 points we've got Wayfarer's Grace, this one's one of the character resurrection type ones, similar to the Eldar Phoenix gem or that Necron stratagem that allows them to return from the dead. When the bearer is slain for the first time, roll a dice and on a 2+, plus, you get to set up the bearer back on the battlefield right next to where it was, and it comes back with 4 wounds remaining. Kind of nice for Leagues of Votan as well, as you still get the judgement token that the unit acquires for killing your character, so I guess that's kind of handy. Seems good enough on most of them, I feel like it might be better on things like the Iron Hair Champion or maybe the Carl. The champion likely to do a fair bit of damage just off his own steam before he goes down. The car could be good to charge a unit as well as throw a judgement token at one of them beforehand. Seems okay, though it is a little bit pricey to be buying it in pre-game for 25 points. You are kind of gambling on your character dying with quite a lot of points there. If he makes it through the game and doesn't die then you've sort of thrown points away in those matches. Plus your opponent might have the opportunity to shoot them dead and then charge them dead once more. So I guess some armies would have some counterplay to it. Overall I feel like the enhancements maybe aren't quite as exciting as the stratagems are, I think out of them my favourite one is probably that appraising glare for counting certain objectives as being more judgement tokens, 
That could be relevant across quite a few units on the opponent's army, and it could be giving some of your best guns extra judgement tokens worth of shooting for quite a lot of the game. Otherwise, a long list and grim demeanour seem kind of fine, and the Wayfarer's Grace I think is alright, but just costs a lot of points and does gamble on certain things happening or not happening. Appraising Glare would be my go-to. Overall, doesn't seem too terrible as a launch detachment. The detachment rule is okay, but not really that exciting. Some of the stratagems are quite nice, and Appraising Glare would be my favourite enhancements to give you some more judgement tokens at least somewhat reliably. Next up though, we're on to the data sheets, and the leagues of Votan do kind of feel like they're a rather undeveloped faction in Warhammer 40k. They don't really have all that many unit choices in their army, and I feel like in 10th edition that's not a particularly good thing for them. With fewer units, there's fewer different unit special rules that you can have on the table, and maybe just a little bit less likelihood that any one individual special rule will be super great. I guess they are kind of guaranteed to have a big second wave with their codex in 10th edition, though at the moment we don't know how soon that's going to be. It seems like it's not going to get there before at least summer next year at the very earliest. For battle line units, we only have the Hearthkin Warriors, kind of expected really as their only troops last time round. And in terms of data sheets, there haven't really been any major losses or gains since in the 9th edition. It wasn't really all that long since their launch codex came out after all. Perhaps the biggest question was how their unique kill team was going to be handled with their jump pack League of Votan guy in it. Seems that Games Workshop have gone a bit halfway on that. The Hearthkin Warriors can actually field the high last rotary cannon that you get on that box, but there's no options for the jump pack guy, or at least nothing more than representing the melee weapon as one in the squad. I guess the jump pack guys will be coming out as their own unit in the future. For broad trends in the data sheets, generally the leagues of Votan have gone down a bit in points. Most of the units are at least decently cheaper, though maybe not absolutely crazily so. They have lost a lot of special rules and some raw power in the judgement tokens but they have had all the war gear options they could pay to take previously rolled into the cost, so things like Hearthkin Warriors can be absolutely tooled up to the nines with all their specialists plus multiple special weapons. For some common stat line things in the army, looks like the standard Hearthkin Warriors and the Carls have gained a pip of toughness, their toughness 5 at base now, handy enough against bolters and heavy bolters, though it does come hand in hand with losing void armour and the AP debuff that that brought, so on a per model basis, I think against a lot of things they're not going to be particularly tougher in 10th edition, particularly not high strength things. The faction leadership is a 7 plus up base, it does mean that their battle shock is going to be more of an issue for them compared with armies like space marines, as you'd probably expect I guess. And perhaps a slightly unexpected nerf, they dropped down to ballistic skill and weapon skill 4 plus as well, at least for units that are less elite and less specialist like the Hearthkin Warriors and even the Mighty Land Fortress. They are going to be depending on their judgement tokens to get up to ballistic skill or weapon skill 3 plus for those now. I feel like this could be quite nasty against certain armies, they are quite vulnerable to modifiers such as stealth. As for common data sheet special rules, as mentioned the void armour is completely gone. The special weapon classes have also been largely altered as well. Their rare weapons just flatly ignored invulnerable saves in 9th edition, but in 10th they just have devastating wounds. Still very good, but not quite as massive. And beam weapons, which were kind of interesting with their ability to potentially skewer multiple units in 9th edition, they've just been changed to sustained hits D3. Big rewards if you manage to hit on 6s, and quite powerful for the conversion ones as well, which get critical hits on a 4 plus if they're at their longer range. They also lost their advanced 3 inches, but no modifier special rule as well. I feel like that's got its positives and negatives. Most of your army still won't want to advance anyway due to not many assault weapons. And it does mean they're going to be a little bit less reliable advancing, but also it does mean that they might have at least some chance of reaching far away objectives, say if something was just an annoying, say, 10 inches away. Overall, it does seem that the general trend has been less massive abilities like void armor, auto wound judgment tokens and things like that, but free war gear and a little bit cheaper and a bit less elite. Getting into the data sheets proper though, and first up we have the Hearthkin Warriors. One of the biggest changes for them was that they dropped down from a big 20 model squad to just 10 man squads, 135 points for 10, though as mentioned that does come with all the weaponry. Kind of a bit sad to lose that option for people who enjoyed playing Horde Votan, perhaps particularly in 10th edition when individual character buffs and stratagems would just be a lot more efficient on a 20 man unit than a 10 man one. Stats wise, as mentioned they've gained a toughness 5, so are a bit more durable against Bolter Fire. They only hit on a 4+, plus, so a lot more dependent on judgement tokens to hit accurately. The Thane no longer has 2 wounds, even though models like the Eldar Exarchs did keep that. He still has his 4+, plus invulnerable save from his special crest though. And they also seem to have become a bit less elite in combat as well. They only get the 1 attack with their strength 4 close combat weapon, rather than 2 as they had before. Meaning in 9th edition they could actually be a medium sort of threat against light infantry in combat. They'd generally be able to overpower a lot of toughness 3 things. Otherwise, with their guns, they've lost a little bit of AP, 
The Baltics have gone down to AB0 in a trend with quite a lot of small arms across the edition. The Ion Blasters no longer cost any points to upgrade at all. They're just strength 5, AP2, but only damage 1 now. I feel like either way around, their small arms just feel a lot less threatening than they used to be, as a lot more of the threat of the squad is actually carried on the special weapons now, as opposed to just the basic troopers. For the special weapons, they get 2 per unit now. I feel like most of them do have their positives and trade-offs. They've got the Magma Rail Rifle, that's strength 12, AP3, and damage D3 plus 3, so definitely very threatening, but it has lost range to 18 inches. And with a heavy keyword, it's hitting on a 5 plus if you move, which it often will need to do to get into that range, I think. I feel like the L7 missile launcher seems like quite an easy to use one. That one will hit on 4s even if you're moving along. A single strength 9 damage D6 shot is pretty good to me. I feel like that one will be a popular one. There's now two versions of the high lads weapons that you can have in the unit, hitting at strength 6, AP1 and damage 1. The high lads rotary cannon gets sustained hits 1. The auto rifle gets rapid fire 3. So 3 shots out to 24 inches and 6 within 12. Out of those two, I think that the rotary cannon is far superior. If you want a volume fire gun, you're probably better with that one even if you're on the move. Finally, there's the Etikan Plasma Beamer, which has lost the beam weapon keyword. A single shot at strength 8, AP3 and damage 2 with sustained hits D3. Again, seems reasonable enough. I suppose you get a lot more hits with that one on average compared with the Magna Rail Rifle if you had to move, but those hits won't be anywhere near as punchy. I think you could make arguments for most of them. I'll probably go with the L7 Missile Launcher as my first pick though. Then for the upgrades, the medic has been traded to a 6 plus feel no pain from the ignores a failed save. Sometimes that'll be better, sometimes it'll be worse, maybe a tiny bit better against things that are damage 1. Damage 2 things won't be quite as impressive for it though, and it won't be reviving any models anymore, the stratagem for that has gone missing. The comms array gives you the chance for slightly more efficient stratagems. If you use the stratagem on them, they get a 5 plus chance to generate one. The scanner is very nice to have in the unit, ignoring cover. And finally, their special rule is to grant sticky objectives, which means that you can potentially move off an objective after you've moved up to it, or the objective will also be yours if the squad gets shot down at range, or they fail battle shock for a turn, which I guess is possible. Overall, I can't help but think they feel a little bit overcosted for what they do. Maybe something to have one or two units of in the army to hold down objectives and get that special rule on the go. They do have a lot of objective control points as well. But I feel like you generally aren't going to want to spam an entire army of them as primary damage dealers in Botan Horde type things. Next up we've got the Iron Hair Hearthguard, which seemed to be one of the winners of the index. 165 points or 330, so really quite a big decrease there. I think they've definitely improved a fair bit relative to what they were. They retained hitting on a 3+, gained a toughness of 6, and they'll usually want to take a character in tow I think, as they have a minus 1 to wound against them if weapons with high strength target the unit. Feels like they should be at least fairly hard to kill given all of that going on, and particularly with 2 plus armor maybe being a bit more valuable than the new edition, with AP for a few weapons having been toned down a bit. For their combat weapons, I think I'd be a bit more tempted by the concussion gauntlets over the plasma blades. It's either 2 attacks at strength 9, AP 2 and damage 2, or 3 at strength 6, AP 2 and damage 1. I think for being so much better against space marines, as well as being a little bit more threatening to vehicles, the strength 9 attacks seem a bit better there. The Concussion Hammer on the Thane actually seems worth taking now as well. 3 attacks hitting on a 4 plus at strength 9 and damage 3. Perhaps partly just good because it gets you the extra attack compared with if you don't take it. Their ranged weapons haven't really changed enormously. Their Etikan Plasma Gun is a single shot at strength 8 and damage 2. Or they've got the Vulcanite Disintegrators for a trio of shots with mortal wounds on the 6s to wound now. They've just got devastating wounds so work a lot more like regular Vulcanite weapons. Both of those seem solid enough and will be better against different targets. I think I might be tempted by the Vulcanite as well, just stacking a bunch of saves and throwing around a bunch of mortal wounds seems like quite a nice idea. They also get that grenade launcher as well, which lost a pip of AP, but does have the 10th edition blast keyword, which is a nice one to have. If you manage to target a unit of 10 or 20 or ranked up, that's going to be a lot of extra hits very quickly there. Finally, there's a choice of Thane Crest to either give him a personal 4 plus invulnerable save, or a teleport crest to give the unit the deep strike ability. Perhaps having Deep Strike seems like a pretty reasonable option. You could get them where they needed to be via Rapid Ingress. They look like a good squad for that, as they move at least somewhat slowly on the board. Overall, look like they're going to be an important unit in the Index. Perhaps one of the best ones for characters to join, and at least fairly threatening in their own right. Next up, the Chthonian Berserks, the melee specialists of the Votan, are 5 or 10 models, 135 or 270. Again, they've gone down at least a reasonable amount compared with previously. Like the rest of them, most of their attacks hit on a 4+, plus, except the Heavy Plasma Axe hits on a 3. 
The Plasma Axe still has its sweep and strike type profiles. The Plasma Axe looks like it's better against both hordes and medium infantry, where the Concussion Maul probably have the edge against both heavy infantry and vehicles. It hits on fours, but damage three is nice. The Gauntlets previously were a sort of underwhelming choice, but now I think are basically auto include. Four attacks on that one at strength nine, AP one, and damage two. But more importantly, the Twin Link special rule. I feel like that just makes them all round the best. Finally, one model probably can and should take a mole grenade launcher as well. Having that extra robot assistant model on the same base gives you an extra wound and an extra attack. And the mole grenade is both a little bit of indirect fire support and also slows down one enemy unit on the roll of a 4+. Not exactly the main focus of the unit, but I suppose it could be kind of disruptive. Or it might be very valuable if you just need to kill literally one thing that's hiding out of line of sight. Finally, their cyber stims now fight on death on a 4+, not automatically. I suppose that's a small nerf there. They have taken a bunch of other things which I think will hurt them a bit. The Feel No Pain no longer gets better against damage 1. You won't be getting those invulnerable saves anymore for a 5 plus invulnerable than the Feel No Pain. It's just going to be a 6 up regular save now. And they have lost access to very easy full re-rolls which they could get for a single command point with that Cyber Sim stratagem. I feel like a lot of their support is lacking a bit and they can't be joined by any characters either. Between all that, I feel like they're probably not in an amazing place going into 10th edition. Despite the small points drop, I feel like they've lost quite a lot of ability, and certainly aren't quite as big a unit that's just going to absolutely annihilate anything off the table that they get their hands on. Kind of surprising that the Concussion Moors aren't a little bit punchier against things like vehicles, they will still be wounding things like a Predator tank on like a 5+, plus now, when previously they would have been a 3, and with better AP as well. Finally, for the leagues of Votan Infantry, we have the Brockier Thunderkin. Compared with 9th edition when these guys were underwhelming for a fair bit, they do look like they could be one of the more interesting damage dealers of the Index now, perhaps partly because they can be attached to by the Brockier Iron Master, and could be nice with that sustained hits too with a Judgment Token stratagem on that Graviton Blast Cannon perhaps. Stat line wise, they remain 3 wounds with a 3 plus save, have gained Toughness 6 from Toughness 5, and can still move and shoot for no penalty with their heavy weapons, they don't have the heavy keyword or anything like that. The heavy weapons are all the same cost, so are very much competing on their own merit. The bolt cannons are strength 6, AP 1 and damage 2 with sustained hits, 3 shots to 36 inches. The grav cannons perhaps look like one of the best damage profiles, D6 shots with blast at strength 5, AP 2 and damage 2. That does look like it's going to be very threatening to both light and medium infantry there. But having anti-vehicle 2 plus also means it's just ludicrously dangerous to tanks as well. A good chance to be taking some serious damage out of a squad of those. The biggest downside being the very close range of 18 inches. Finally, the SP Conversion Beamer is a single shot out to 24 inches. Strength 7, AP 1 and damage 3. But it's got Conversion and Sustained Hits D3. So you get D3 extra hits for every hit that you get on it that's a 4 plus or more, which is its native ballistic skill. For comparison, it is kind of similar to firing 3 shots at that profile if you're between 12 and 24 inches, at least on average. Overall, definitely a bit of a trade-off between range and damage going on there. The longer range ones are less threatening and the closer range ones more so. I guess maybe you could theoretically have the grav cannons delivered out of a land fortress, but a bit sad that you can't fit a full squad of 6 in. Their special rule is to overwatch on a 5+, plus, which I guess is nice enough. I think they can be taken in a big enough unit where their overwatch is going to be pretty meaningful. Overall, seem fairly solid fire support. Wouldn't be too surprised to see a few units of them taken in Votan lists. Next up, we've got the Hernkin Pioneers, definitely one of the standout units of the Codex in 9th edition, now maybe a little bit less carrying the entire army, but still pretty usable. 3 models for 105, or 6 models for 210, and now they do get all their fancy gear included, so you can take one of the heavy weapons, plus their 3 different upgrades if you have the models too. They still scout to 9 inches, and still have a better movement than most of the leagues of Votan models do. They've gained toughness 6 for a little bit more durability against heavy bolters and the like, and I would bear in mind that for their stat line, Fly is a bit less powerful on mounted units now. They can't just indiscriminately hop straight over terrain. They'll need to go around tall things for the most part. Weapons-wise, their standard guns haven't seen any massively enormous changes. The Magna Coil Auto Cannons are still Strength 7 and Damage 2. I guess it does mean that they're a bit less of a threat against medium armor than they used to be. Most of the tanks they wounded on a 4+, plus will now need a 5+. plus. Then for the big heavier bike with the double rider, you get either the high last rotary cannon or the ion beamer. Out of those two, I think I still prefer the high last rotary cannon very slightly. It's got longer range and will hit with a few more shots, even if it is strength 6 and AP 1, as opposed to strength 7 and AP 2. Not a load in them though, the ion beamer does get sustained hits D3 as well. 
For their upgrades, they can take it on the ones that don't have a heavy weapon. The comms array is command point things, the same as the halfkin. The scanners also ignores cover, and that one seems like the highest priority one to have. Then you get the roll bar searchlight, which no longer has the stratagem option to hand out judgement tokens, sadly. But does counteract the stealth ability. Again, that could be kind of handy with their anti-infantry type shooting that they have. Their special rule is a redeploy one. If they need to, then they can move off the board at the board edge, and they re-enter a strategic reserve to combat the next turn. Quite a nice move to pull in the late game, could allow you to threaten the foe from a different angle, though I guess they do have some pretty reasonable movement already, so it might not always be necessary. I'd imagine that these probably won't be run in massive numbers like they might have been sometimes in the past, probably used a bit more for their actual role of going forward and seizing the midfield early. With a big scout move and a nice normal move means that you could be getting lines of sight to things that otherwise most of the army can't see. Or maybe doing annoying movement blocking things to hold up the enemy advance. They're still not really all that expendable though when there are 105 points for 3. Next up we've got the Leagues of Botan Moonboggy Motor Pool with the Sagittor and the Land Fortress. The Sagittor is a few points cheaper and also doesn't have to pay for its fancier weapons now. 120 points with its transport capacity of 6 and the option to split down a Hearthkin Warrior Squad into two smaller units. That does seem like quite a good advantage, and probably one that's worth making use of. We could perhaps leave some cheap guys with bolters to man a home field objective, and put the exciting special weapons to be delivered to the front line where they'll get in range. Perhaps the nicest boost for it is that it's gained a 6 inch scout move, so you could also have this scouting forward alongside your Hernkin. Does mean that in the first turn you could get your Hearthkin Warriors really quite a long way up the board. This could move 18 inches, then they could get out 3, and be able to shoot the enemy from there. Certainly looks like it should be easily enough to get onto midfield objectives. You could maybe even play a little bit cagier with this and start it a bit further back as a result. Otherwise, for its own personal stats, it's gained toughness 10, so it's at least a decent amount tougher against small arms, even if a lot of anti-tank weapons still won't have much trouble with it, particularly now it's lost void armour. For its main guns, I feel like you probably want either the Sagittor missile launcher or the Highlands anti-tank gun. The Sagittor missiles come with the L7 missile launcher built in as well. It basically depends whether you want a few more shots and the flexibility to go anti-infantry mode or just to absolutely double down on the anti-tank with just two big shots at strength 12, AP3 and damage D6 with sustained hits D3. The Sagittor special rule is that it can advance and still drop units. I feel like this one's a bit of an underwhelming one really. I guess maybe if it's absolutely critical and that's the only way to get to an objective it could be alright but giving up the guns of the Sagittor for a turn seems like a steep price to pay particularly as within 6 inch scout move and also its regular move it's got quite a lot of movement already. Definitely seems usable though, some at least fairly scary guns on top of it plus the bolt cannons and splitting Hearthkin warrior squad seems worthwhile. You could also use it as a battlefield bunker to charge Caponian berserks out of. The Hecaton Land Fortress is 245 points, going down really quite a lot from before, though its stats were kind of immense there both in terms of damage and defence and scary railguns firing through invulnerables. It still has its transport capacity of 12, exo armour having 2 model slots and the exo frames having 3, so it can't really handle all that many of the exo armoured thunderkin. On the defensive, it's a big toughness 12, 2 plus save and 16 wounds, definitely a struggle to handle for certain armies, particularly with high AP being a tiny bit less widespread in 10th than 9th. For the main guns, you're still choosing between the massive single shot railgun, a heavy SP conversion beamer with more threat at longer range than closer, or a general purpose psychic ion cannon. All of these will be hitting on a 3 plus an 8 lead though, so ideally this one really wants to be targeting judgement token units to get the best value out of these really big guns. I feel like it's perhaps particularly brutal for that rail cannon, hitting on a 4 plus is just super unreliable for a single shot, even if it's a very good one with strength 18 and damage d6 plus 6. I guess at least that one gets heavy, so you get to hit on a 3 plus if you stay still, though you might not always be able to, as well as gain line of sight. I suppose if that is on the board, that certainly gives you something to spend command point rerolls on. Rerolling a failed wound roll on that against, say, an enemy tank is going to give you about as good value as anything in 40k. Otherwise, the Psychic Ion Cannon is general purpose, strength 9 and damage 2 with d6 plus 3 shots, and the Heavy SP Conversion Beamer is 2 shots at strength 10, AB2 and damage 4, again with that conversion rule for an extra d3 hit if you fire it greater than 12 inches. After the other two, I think that probably the Conversion Beamer is the better one. You'd average similar kind of hits, and the Beamer has better strength and damage if he can keep it in the sweet spot. For the secondary weapons, you get Bolt Cannons and Ion Beamers, Probably the bolt cannon is the stronger of the two in my opinion now, with damage 2 on those but only damage 1 on the ion beamers, 
even if they do get other rules. And then as before, you get the option of a Hextile Warhead for a big single shot with lots of shots at Strength 7, AP 2 and Damage 2. You could fire out of line of sight if you needed to, or just have Ignore's cover on the Land Fortress all game long. I feel like probably out of the two, the Ignore cover is perhaps the better option still, particularly in 10th edition with a lot of options to get cover. Finally, its special rule is its fire support rule, kind of similar to a few other transports in the game. If it targets something that the unit inside also targets in the shooting phase, they get to re-roll the wound roll against it. That's a solid damage buff for anything that it could transport. Very nice on devastating wounds, iron here, Vulcanites I suppose, or things like those graviton cannons against enemy infantry on the Thunderkin. Overall, I think it looks fairly usable at 245 points. Big defensive stats and still a whole bunch of scary guns. Again, this one looks like a very threatening one to use that sustained hit stratagem on. Though I guess it might not affect all the guns equally if you say it did take the conversion beamer perhaps. It is kind of hilarious to have at least the option of getting three shots out of the railgun though if you rolled a six against that stratagem on a judgment token unit. Finally, we've got the leagues of Votan characters, starting off with the standard car. 90 points for basically a Votan captain. He brings the judgment tokens and also a damage boost to his unit. He's allowed to lead both the Iron Here Hearth Guard and the Hearthkin Warriors. Pretty handy that Games Workshop didn't decide to give arbitrary armor restrictions on those this time. It would have meant very few options for the leagues of Votan army. Stats wise, his toughness 5 now. Lost to wounds to just 4 wounds. And has the choice of either 4 attacks with a 4 draw plasma axe with strength 5 and damage 2, or 3 attacks with a mass gauntlet that hits a bit worse but a much better strength at strength 8 and damage 3. After the 2 I think I'll be more tempted with the mass gauntlet there for the big extra damage. Then for what he brings through the units, he gets lethal hits for his squad. Not bad, but a little bit annoying that it doesn't have any synergy whatsoever with judgment tokens, though I suppose extra auto wounds are never going to be a bad thing. He's still the bringer of judgment tokens as well. One judgment token handed out in the command phase for a unit that he can see. It does mean that he'll often need to play just a little bit aggressively and make sure that he can actually see the enemy's heavy hitters, which I guess could mean exposing his squad to some damage. With the new character rules, it means there's less scope for just having him in view but untargetable somehow. He will actually need a squad that's fairly tanky to expose him with. Finally, he's got a choice of two different crests, either granting deep strike or a 5 plus invulnerable save to his units. He could have some deep strike hearthkin warriors if he wanted to, or he could give his iron here hearth guard the deep strike rule, meaning that the Thane on that unit could take the 4 plus invulnerable save, I suppose. The 5 plus invulnerable save does actually look quite nice on the Hearthkin though, particularly with a 4 plus save and no void armor. Overall seems okay, not too terrible combat stats, lethal hits is fine, and he is one of the main ways that you get judgment tokens. There's no limit to taking more than one of these now, so you could have multiple if you'd like. Overall seems like a strong HQ. Next up we've got Uthar the Destined, which I feel is maybe a little bit disappointing compared with the car. He's 115 points, so 25 more. For his personal stats, he is both more durable and a bit more dangerous, I think, as well. His Blade of the Ancestors gets 5 attacks at Strength 6, AP 3 and Damage 2, and it also has Devastating Wounds too, so it can be fairly dangerous in combat. He still hands out Judgment Tokens, just like the regular Carl, but otherwise his other two special rules are just personal ones that don't help out his squad at all. He doesn't give them lethal hits like the Carl does, instead gets an automatic 6 when he does some damage once per turn, I guess that could be kind of nice to stack with the Blade of the Ancestors for mortal wounds there. And he still has that rule that reduces enemy damage to 1 when they're tanked on him individually. I suppose he is a model that will be really quite hard to kill. If his squad gets wiped, then he's going to take a lot of individual shots to bring down. And it's at least fairly dangerous in combat, particularly against medium infantry. Overall though, I think he feels like a bit of a secondary pick compared with a cheaper car, who brings the lethal hits as well as some fair threat with the rest. Next we've got the Iron Hair Champion, 75 points and another big drop there. He can only lead the Iron Hair Hearthguard, perhaps not too surprising seeing as he's got Exo armor. Generally I do feel he's a bit of a diminished model in terms of stat line and threat. He's gained toughness 6 but has lost multiple other barriers to damage, like his minus 1 to wound in combat, minus 1 damage and the void armor of course. He gets the choice between an axe that's really quite good at killing elite infantry or a mass hammer for just 3 attacks at strength 12, AP 2 and damage D6 plus 1. Still very scary, but not quite as terrifying as that exacto hammer could be, particularly without fighty warlord traits to back it up. It's got a special rule for his mass driver accelerators, for usually D3 mortal wounds on the charge, so that will help him out a little bit, and he can also re-roll the charge roll, so it could help the Iron Hair Hearthguard hit home a little bit more reliably, I suppose. Finally, his crests either give him the choice of getting a 4 plus invulnerable save for him personally, or teleporting his unit into battle once more. 
depending on whether you need to start on or off the board. Overall seems okay, he is at least fairly cheap, and he does add some mortal wounds, an extra big threat to the squad, even if he isn't the single biggest synergy piece in the world. Next up, for 75 points we've got the Grimnir, he's also quite cheap, can only join the Hearthkin Warriors this time, and he comes along with his two Corv robots, kind of handy little damage tanks within the unit, they basically do a similar sort of job to standard Hearthkin Warriors with their stat line, basically the same toughness and able to blaze away with the bolters in the same way. He helps out with Battleshock perhaps more than anyone else in the Votan army, gives the unit a 6 plus leadership, and also allows you to cancel a failed Battleshock test once per game. I guess it means that you've got a squad of very brave Hearthkin Warriors, though how much value that really is is a little bit more questionable perhaps. Your other unit still won't be protected, and if they did happen to fail an incidental one while they were on an objective, their special rule will still mean that they have the point anyway, unless your opponent's on it too. Otherwise though, the main boost that he brings to the unit is a fairly good shooting attack, 6 shots at strength 6, AP 2 and damage D3 if he's willing to risk the hazardous roll, and he gets perhaps one of the better powers from that discipline baked in, making your Hearthkin Warriors a big toughness 6, definitely helpful against some guns a bit more than others, I guess it does mean that things like las guns or heavy bolters will be just massively less threatening to them there. Overall doesn't seem to be a terrible choice to add to a squad of Hearthkin Warriors. I feel like with the cores thrown in, you're almost paying for a bit of a bigger unit straight out the bat. And then the Grimnir brings a fair bit of personal threats with the shooting and a bit more melee. And on top of that, toughness 6 and leadership things seems alright. Finally, last but not least, we have the Brockier Iron Master. Also 75 points as well, and for this one you get an entire squad of things. I feel like that does have a lot of value of its own to a unit that he joins, means that you've got more tanks to soak things in a squad of Hearthkin Warriors, and it seems particularly nice for the Brockier Thunderkin as well, as he could have those ECOGs eat some high value, high damage hits before you have to take it on actual Thunderkin models. The assistant models aren't too threatening, but have a little bit of combat and range. The Iron Master himself though adds a fair bit to the squad in terms of some grav fire, He's got a grab rifle with 3 shots that's damage 3 and wounds vehicles on a 2 plus. Looks like quite a nice insert that goes well with the Thunderkin squad there. And he backs them up with yet more anti-vehicle in melee with the Graviton Hammer. For his buffing rules he gives his squad a plus 1 to hit just innately. That is kind of nice but does mean that your first judgement token is going to be pointless with that. I suppose it means that his unit could afford to shoot at something a bit different and then save the judgement tokens for something that your other units are going to shoot. And he also does some mechanic things as well, repairing either a vehicle or exo-frame model with 3 wounds per turn normally. So while he doesn't improve the damage output of things like land fortresses, he could still help them out with some repairs. Overall, for the amount that he brings, I feel like bringing his own small squad, two good special rules, and some personal threats with grav weapons actually makes him really quite a good model for the cost. Definitely seems feasible to be leading a Hearthkin Warrior squad, or maybe a masked up Thunderkin unit. Perhaps either with the Graviton Blast Cannons or those Conversion Beamers coming in from Reserve. I feel like maybe the most annoying thing for him though is that he can't be in a Land Fortress alongside one of those units due to having too many models in his squad. I feel like that's kind of where he wants to be, getting out of the Land Fortress and getting the Wound rerolls. But unfortunately that's not to be. I guess ideally you want him leading some Thunderkin to repair those, or leading either units and being beside a Land Fortress rather than in it. So anyway, there we have it, the League of Votan Index still doesn't really have all that many options in terms of characters and squads. I'd say maybe out of the data sheets, the ones that are perhaps the more interesting are probably the Iron Here Hearthguard, Brockier Thunderkin, and the Land Fortress maybe, perhaps backed up by some Hearthkin Warriors and Sagittors, but perhaps in smaller numbers. Most of the index does seem kind of usable in smaller numbers. I'd guess that for battle line units, it's probably going to be the Thunderkin, the Hearthguard, and the Land Fortresses that perhaps take up the most of your points. Most of the characters do seem at least fairly reasonable for the cost, and looks like they could justify themselves to add on to units. I feel like Uthar the Destined is perhaps a bit lower down the list, otherwise probably my favourites are just the standard Carl for the Judgement tokens and lethal hits, or maybe the Brockier Iron Master as he comes with basically an entire squad attached as well good for soaking damage for valuable models or even just Hearthkin. It does perhaps seem that for the first few months of 10th edition they might be a slightly harder army to play with than most, still having a bit of inflexibility with short ranges and limited units to fill certain battlefield roles, but not quite as much raw strength and power as they had before from their massively crazy judgement tokens. I wouldn't be too surprised if at some point in the future they got some points buffs, maybe some units dropping in points in September or the January update, though I suppose we'll wait and see on that front. Let me know what you're making of them so far in 10th edition anyway, what armies are having good success for you, and which things would you consider most auto-include or most passable out of the index. 
If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, while certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep these videos coming. Channel patrons do get a few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.